right, good morning, y'all. <clears throat> that was supposed to go over way better than I expected. That y'all thing, I'm actually kind of inspired by this town a little bit. I'm thinking I'm taking up a country western music artist career. Uh, but then I realized I couldn't, uh, I can't sing unless it's Ice Ice Baby and it's karaoke and after a few drinks. And so I, I don't also plan to wear cowboy boots or cowboy hats, so I figured I gotta get my country dialect down a little bit. But I've been practicing that for a few days and apparently it didn't go over nearly as well as I'd anticipated. Um, without further ado, I do have a ton of information to go over, hence the reason why I asked uh, Jason not to even talk about my bio at all. Hopefully the presentation will speak for itself. Uh, that's my hope and intention. But I want to start by congratulating you all for being here. Did you notice how I worked out of you all in there? Okay, maybe I'm that smooth with it already. But I want to congratulate you all for being here because your commitment to excellence is what drives me and the rest of the presenters to continue to do what they do. And it's not so much to congratulate you for being in this room, even though this is about to be pretty rock star. But, but here's, the, here's the fact of the matter, is there's a lot of complacency, not only in our industry, but in our world as a whole. So your commitment to continue to get better and improve is really what drives us all to get better information. So kudos to you, and you deserve a pat on the back as well. So if you have a, a buddy next to you, please feel free to do so. Um, the, the presentation that I'm about to give is gonna be a little different, okay? The reason why it's gonna be a little different is as sim I'm simply trying to implore you to think differently about some thoughts and about a very misunderstood, or what I feel is a very misunderstood topic in our industry. And one that personally, I've actually never seen an entire presentation done on. I've seen a clip here or there, and the fact of the matter is you can open up just about any research journal, and you don't see anything directed towards this topic. Okay, and I think that's a shame because I think it's huge and it's doing our athletes a huge disservice. And hopefully I'm gonna convince you of that as well. So I may say some stuff that isn't completely right either because there just isn't a lot of empirical evidence out there. Okay, people think they know, but in many cases, as you're gonna find out, we may not fully understand this idea. And because of that, I'm imploring you to think about it a little more fully. Any of the research or sports science people in this room, I hope you take a some of my words to heart, and you try to do something to give us a little more insight in regards to this all important topic. Beyond that, as you're gonna find, is I already talk pretty fast. I don't know, for those of you who've seen me talk before, I have way more slides and way more information than I can fit in within 50 minutes, okay? That was done for a couple of reasons. First off, the, the presentation is actually designed for 90 minutes, so I'm already gonna be trying to, to keep myself from getting yanked off this stage, okay? But that being said, any of the information that you have in front of you, either in the booklet or I implore you to download it as well, go through it, hit me up afterwards, or in the hallway, as most of you who have heard me present before, I'll sit in the hallway till you know the crack of dawn. Actually, I take that back. I can only sit out there till 7 p.m. because I, I gotta watch my guys in purple kick some green and gold ass tonight. So I will sit out there until 7 p.m. if I need to, and I have no problems, uh, no qualms speaking with you about this topic afterwards, okay? So it's pretty lengthy, and I'm pretty excited about the topic, so we're gonna get going, okay? Hopefully there. So we are talking about deceleration qualities. If you made it to the wrong room, you can go ahead and leave now. What I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna give you any prepackaged programs. So if that's also what you're anticipating or expecting, you probably should uh, check out a different session or maybe go get a second breakfast. But what I wanna do is give you the bigger picture. I wanna bring us to a common ground and I wanna help you understand what it is that I see when I work with my NFL guys. Those of you who don't know me or know my background very well, all of the athletes that I personally work with now on a yearly basis are all from the National Football League. So obviously I work with a fairly high level of mastery of athlete. But what I continue to find over and over and over again that this is the missing link and, I'm gonna, and I hope you're gonna find that as well. So I'm gonna help you understand the importance of it. We're gonna look at the movement mastery that's uh, expected when we talk about deceleration and we're gonna hopefully get to some training means, methods, uh, et cetera, some training principles that are specific to deceleration and deceleration qualities. But first, I wanna to come to a common ground. With those guys that I'm hired to train, it's, it's a cutthroat business, as you guys know. Anyone who's ever worked in the NFL, any, been around any NFL players, it doesn't stand for not for long for any good reason, okay? So they hire me for one reason, one reason only. 
It's not to squat more. It's not to even increase their 40 time or decrease their 40 time, hopefully. It's not to jump higher or jump further or complete the pro agility quicker. The hair frame, one reason, and that's to get better on Sunday, or in this case tonight, Saturday night at 7 p.m., okay? That's the only reason why they hire me. It's not only the same thing for me, it's the same thing for you, okay? Your athletes come to you for one reason and one reason only. They may think they want a bigger bench or squat or hand cleaner or faster 40, and those things may be true. They may help them do what they do on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, wherever, whenever and wherever your game is played. But all of it comes down to a couple different factors. For me, my mission is to perfect movement execution, specific technical mastery, while concurrently optimizing specific motor potential. So with a high level of mastery of athlete that I work with, and I feel that it is no different for most of you in this room, if we have athletes that are intermediate, high, elite level of mastery, that it comes down to optimizing specific motor potential, and deceleration is no different. So I have a couple quotes here uh, from the late and great Dr. Yuri Verkoshansky, who um, I was glad enough and uh, blessed enough to know, but a couple quotes from him that really hit home to me, they're, they're hung above my desk, because it reminds me every day that I'm not about a faster 40, and I'm not about a higher jump height, even though I'm the jump guy, okay? It's about movement, guys. It's about movement, and it's about pro problem-solving activity of movements that help you do what you do on the field on Sunday night, or Saturday night, excuse me, or whenever it may be. And deceleration is a huge component of that. In fact, I would argue that it's the missing component or missing link for many of your programs and to get the transfer and attain the transfer that we're after. So what are we doing well, okay? As professionals, let's, let's come to a SWOT analysis here. What are we doing well? Well, we're concentrically dominated, as you can probably find out. We're also doing some corrective and functional things, as you can see in some of these pictures that depict that. But what we find is that we have a lot of athletes, and I had this a number of years back. Uh, my business now has been in existence for six years, going on seven, and we've had a host of NFL players that entire time, just based on some of my connections from in the past. And what I was finding is I was making them stronger, I was making them faster, I was making them jump higher and further and even complete pro agilities quicker. But then I watched them actually move out on the field on Sunday. And even though I was patting them my back on, on one day saying, I made them this much better, look at how much their, their squat improved or whatever it may be, even measures of rate of force development and power expression I didn't see the type of change that I had wanted or desired or they were hiring me for. They knew they were getting stronger. They saw the times were going down with their 40 or their pro agility or even their 5, 10, whatever it may be. But what they realized is that we weren't having the same level of transfer. So ironically enough, I, I don't claim to be a genius unless you see me at about 12.30 this evening and I'm out on the town. Okay. Uh, but what I am blessed with is a lot of logical reasoning. And I had to come to the conclusion at that point that my program and my preparation plans were missing something. And here's what they were missing, which I would argue that most of your programs are missing as well. An emphasis on the eccentric deceleration qualities, especially in a multi-planar fashion, and to make things that are sport functional. You see these individuals on the picture. Okay, LaShawn McCoy, maybe this generation's Barry Sanders, for those of you who've seen him play. Rafa Nadal, obviously a very dynamic, explosive, crazy mover. Then this goofy basketball guy who I have no idea who he is. I just couldn't find a picture of Chris Paul uh, jump stopping, so I put this guy in because that was a pretty sweet picture that popped up. So don't worry about him. And then Serena Williams, just a freak of nature. And then my boy AD28 down in the bottom there, who if there are any, any MVP voters in the room, give that boy MVP on his mantle. Okay, um, we would appreciate it. So, you see, what are the things that make them different are not the concentric, it's not the corrective, it's not the functional, because the functional is right here, guys. It's the eccentric, it's the multiplanar, it's the motor potential that is specific to that which occurs out on the field, out on the court, out on the rink, out on the track. Deceleration, baby. Okay. So the need for this new focus, understanding deceleration, it's all to put the athlete in an efficient and effective position for re-acceleration, okay? 
we can stop much differently if all we have to do is concern ourselves with just stopping and coming to a complete stop. That motion and that whole motor task is gonna be considerably different than if I have to focus on reacceleration or completing a sport task after I have stopped. Completely different strategy. But most of the research that's out there at this point has just come down to stopping. Okay? The last time, and, and we have an unlimited time or distance in order to stop, and we know that's not sport, guys, because in sport we both have a limited time and distance, and the quicker we can do it, and the more efficiently we can get there, the better off we're gonna be, okay? So the thing that makes us different is right here, this need and this desire to have more deceleration. This is a great graph um, that, that really just graphically illustrates something that the entire concept of, of what we're gonna talk about for the remainder of the, the 40 minutes or whatever the heck I got, okay? This is uh, from Cal Dietz and Ben Peterson uh, in their latest book, Tri Triphasic Training, and I love it because it shows exactly what it is that I see and have seen for the last number of years with my NFL guys. The thing that separates the top guy from the elite guy or even the top guy from the intermediate or the intermediate from the beginner is closing this V, okay? This idea of power absorption versus power exertion. Essentially what we find is before we can exert maximal force, we gotta be able to absorb it. Because it doesn't matter what our concentric power capabilities are, if we can't take in the types of forces needed to do it rapidly, to absorb force at a, at a very ready rate, and this illustrates that exactly. So the more steep we can make that V, the more force we can take in in a rapid fashion, and the more we can expect to put out, which is what all of our goal is. So our main objective is this, as I've said on a number of cases, and I'm gonna to continue to tell you, because we need to revisit it, is it always comes down to both specific motor potential and technical mastery. We can't expect it to just occur because we want it to. Just because we increase maximum strength or maximum force capabilities, we can't expect it to transfer unless we utilize it and get the technical mastery, attain the technical mastery in order to explosively break, okay? Just like in the absorption that will occur when we're going through eccentric muscle contractions in a very rapid fashion, okay? What happens if we don't? We know the drill, right? Technical inefficiency, and you see that time and time again, okay, from most of your athletes, if you watch them stop or try to change direction, we see a lack of movement control, Okay, this is often where injuries happen, and then obviously we have an increased injury likelihood. So not only decreased performance, but also very increased injury likelihood, and we've all seen it. Okay? So before we can exert maximal force, we must be able to absorb it. The next number of slides were essentially my scientific filler, if you will, um, when this presentation was going to be longer, but I couldn't find a single slide when I knew it had to be 50 minutes to be able to cut out. So I wanted to give you all this information. I wanted to try and help you wrap your head around the way that I think about this topic, and hopefully to help you uh, as you go throughout this process as well. This is a fantastic deterministic model. The only thing I would really add to it likely would be something in regards to elastic energy and tendon utilization um, on one side there. So if, I know you can't really see this very well, but you can find it in 2008 in the Strength and Conditioning Journal, okay? Great, great article. This was from an, uh, a deceleration article for tennis specific athletes, but it has a lot of application for many other sports, okay? Um, next, we start to talk about working effect. Again, I'm only gonna briefly go over these, so please feel free at any point to um, throw something at me if you want me to elaborate a little bit more fully, okay? But I could also do that uh, at a later time. But what I want you to think about is the sports specific force time qualities, okay? The types of strength. Because what we notice is there's very specific types of strength that are often being utilized or needed and desired in order to increase the deceleration qualities. It's not only deceleration qualities, it could be for the, the aim or task of anything it is that, that we're looking for, okay? We know that very specific strength qualities. Those numbers correspond to different types of strength, guys. Okay, this is from Sippenberg Koshansky and all the editions of Super Training. Uh, number one there is gonna be starting strength, number two, acceleration strength, number three, rate of force development, number four, explosive strength or the idea of where that slope is of rate of force development, number five, maximum force, number six, strength endurance, and number seven, finally, deceleration strength. But what we find, if you really take a peek at this, is that a number of those strength qualities happen isometrically. 
which is exactly what we have to have if we're going to completely stop on a dime. So if we're not utilizing any isometric means and methods, we are likely missing the boat when it comes down to developing the idea to stop on a dime. Okay? We also see the idea that obviously force and time needs to be applied very, very quickly. Okay? Especially if we bring a dynamic idea in here. This isn't an isometric force time curve like we're used to seeing in most of the research journals that have very little application if we're talking about maximum force because we know that takes a longer time. Okay? The other idea that we need to go back to or revisit, I won't make this an overly scientific talk, but the eccentric specific force velocity characteristics in contrast to the concentric. We all know that on a concentric force velocity curve that as force goes up, what happens to velocity? Goes down, right? They have an inverse relationship to one another. But what we find in dynamic human movement with the eccentric side is that we develop force and velocity concurrently together, meaning that as one goes up, the other is high as well. Okay? And if we don't possess the ability to stabilize, stop, stabilize, absorb that type of force, we're going to be completely uncontrollable. Okay? And that's where we have the lack of movement efficiency in most of our athletes. The other side of it is this. We can see, based on this graph, that eccentric forces and the types of forces that our body needs to absorb when it's going through explosive lengthening contractions is much, much greater than that on the concentric end. I know we've all heard that, but it bears repeating here today because if we don't work on it, if the only thing you focus in on is that one slide of the concentric acceleration type idea, we're going to miss this. Okay? A couple ideas here. This is also from Sif and Verkushansky in Super Training. All human motion is the result of the balance between stability and mobility, number one. Number two, that an increase or production of any strength quality, any strength quality whatsoever, is going to start at the neuromuscular process. Big concept for us to think about. Guys, this is just a review, okay? So I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. I wanted to talk about the idea between stability and mobility being the use of elastic energy like I talked about earlier. We've all seen that in the NSCA books. If you haven't, uh, I'm a huge science geek, much more than I am a country star, so I'd be willing to talk to you about this all day, every day, out in the hall, okay? Dampening efficiency, huge when it comes to deceleration ability. Dampening efficiency is essentially the relationship between elasticity of the system and the stiffness of the system, okay? The stiffness being the body's ability to resist the applied load, which is what needs to occur on a deceleration qualities of any movement. We need to recruit the, the stretch reflex here to help us from a concentric end. That's all I'm gonna say about that. But this one I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more because this takes that neurophysiological model just a step further. Because preactivity is huge for us. All three of these concepts are actually pretty huge for us when we look at deceleration. Preactivity of the agonist muscle group, huge, okay? Because if the, we get the certain muscle groups, we get the right muscle groups, I should say, to preactivate before our foot touches down in either our penultimate step or our plant step, our body will be ready to put itself or reorient itself for an effective reacceleration, okay? We also have to look a little bit here at reciprocal inhibition of the antagonist, but this is a bit of a misnomer, a bit of a misapplied uh, uh, topic here when we talk about deceleration, because we likely will need to have some co-contraction at the bottom of our deceleration motion in order to completely stop ourselves more rapidly. So that one is in there just for the sake of it. Um, the second one, or the third one, excuse me, the GTOs is huge, because the GTOs will shut off everything for reacceleration if it cannot handle or resist the loads appropriately. Okay, so we have to look in all of our training to look at desensitizing that so we can get an increased reacceleration. This is just phase by phase for fun because I dig the stress shortening cycle, okay? But here's the rub, okay? With both models and everything that I just flipped through in the last 90 seconds, it all comes down to stress shortening cycle efficiency. I want to remind you, all of you who are CSCS or CPT certified or any other uh, idea that you've ever looked at, if you've looked at the stress shortening cycle, we know a couple things. That in order to get it to enhance everything that we do after, our motion needs to be fast, it needs to be rapid. So the stretch phase needs to occur quickly because if we have too long a time between the start of the stretch, and this would be in every step that I take, there's too long a time between the start of the stretch and the start of the concentric or overcoming phase, we are likely not going to utilize the stress shortening cycle to its maximum efficiency. It also occurs if the movement is over too long a range of motion, too large range of motion. So if the, we allow the force to dissipate, 
which is often advocated by many ideas or training means and methods that are out there to work on deceleration ability. So when I say dampen, guys, or I'm talking about the ability to resist, we dampen too much to let those forces dissipate. Anyone who's telling you to do that, unless you're at a very, very, very low level, is probably not going to understand that you have to re-accelerate or put yourself in a position to execute a movement skill as explosively as possible. Because that is not the way to more productive movement. Okay? This is a little bit more uh, in basic terms. The rate of stretch is more important than the magnitude or the range of motion. Okay? The rate of stretch is important. So a slow deceleration equals a slow reacceleration. Uh, being slow into the break, so being slow to there, is likely going to equate to slow out of the break. I don't give a crap what your squat strength is or what your rate of force development is, and no matter how it's measured. Okay. So enough about the the what and the why, and I actually am very shocked that I kept it to that much. Um, but I'd be happy to to discuss those topics any further from there. Um, this is also from Verkashansky. This is the idea or a system towards attaining not only deceleration in sport, guys, but really any specific aim that we look at. And I believe it represents a paradigm shift, at least in my opinion. And it, it definitely equates for me with a higher level of mastery of athlete, and I would argue that it equates for every level of mastery on down. Okay? It's the idea of combining specific motor potential, which is A there, it's the top curve. I'm sorry if you can't see that, but it's the top one that's a little more re linear relationship there and the technical mastery. Because people throw around technical mastery like it's just gonna happen, that we're just gonna self-optimize. If that was the case, all NFL players that come to me would be, have the cleanest, most efficient movement mechanics ever, ever fought in order to man, okay? But we have somehow missed the boat, especially with this idea of deceleration. That's why this is huge, okay? The, the vertical axis there is gonna be preparedness or level of preparedness. So as level of preparedness goes up, this could be the idea of process of attaining greater sports mastery in regards to any motor task versus the, the horizontal axis there, which is labeled S for the sporting result or level of sporting mastery, which is what my guys hire me for. So I need to continue to close that gap and bring those two together. Anything that detracts from technical mastery that we cannot utilize, is not gonna be efficient for me to go attain. The other side of this is this, when we talk about technical mastery, is a couple points that you're gonna see when I talk about the technique, and I bears repeating right now, is that we need to get out of this idea that what works for one is going to work for another. I mean in regards to technical movement execution. We must all be different. All of our athletes are different human beings, okay? Just because Barry Sanders, is the, Barry Sanders is the greatest decelerator and change of direction artist ever to live, doesn't mean I should take every single one of my guys and try to emulate what it is that he does. Just like I, if I want to run a faster 100, I can't expect to move like Usain Bolt. That's rub number one in regards to technical mastery. Rub number two is this. Technique is never constant if we look at this. Technique is never constant. So just because we attained it at one point, if they're at a very low level, what happened to our motor potential over that time? If we, let's say, fast forward four weeks, or four years, or 12 years, or 14 years, the motor potential changed, so so did the technical mastery. The technical mastery is how well we utilize the motor potential that we have been given, okay? So those are my objectives, guys. It doesn't matter if it's deceleration. It doesn't matter what the topic is. That's it for me. Improve technical mastery, improve technique. Every time I improve technique, I improve motor potential that's specific to that technique. And of course, my aims can be much more specific and they need to be much more specific. For example, with uh, guys that I train, we look at one or two factors for the entire off season. I realize that you guys aren't, and that's after we've gone through GPP type phases, okay? But then we might have eight, 12, 16 weeks where the only thing we might focus in on is deceleration in his specific movement execution, okay? And that's what we're gonna talk about here. But the problem is this, as I've already alluded to prior to this point, is in regards to the deceleration kinetics and kinematics, is there isn't a whole lot of stuff out there. I mean, how many presentations or how many articles have you seen that addresses just deceleration? This likely may be the first, 
And if you're trying to recall through the strength and conditioning journals, you can probably count three or four. Okay? So a lot of the stuff that I'm about to present over the remainder of this presentation, this is a caveat, is my opinion. Okay? If you're not okay with that opinion, I'm okay with that. But don't just write it on my feedback that this guy's a complete uttering, blubbering moron and then go out about your day. Do something about it and try to get your own ideas. I cannot teach you anything right now. All I can do is try to get you to think about things in a little different fashion and that's what I'm trying to do. Okay? So we need to, to really make a, a push for this as an industry and let's, let's try to lead that charge from here on forward. Okay? This is a blend of the, the very little existing research that's out there and the qualitative study that I've done with very high level of mastery of athletes. That's my caveat, okay? Who already don't know how to move, mind you, okay? So we've done them wrong somewhere along the way. But what I do know is this, is the stuff that I'm about to show you, is when we look at deceleration movement technique, how I already made the mention that it's not constant, there is no optimal technique for everyone, there's a host of different factors, both sports specific as well as individual specific, that are, we're gonna have to ad address in order to get a better handle and a better idea if we're doing everything for our athlete in order to make them better from a technical mastery standpoint. Sports specific considerations here, guys. Uh, both within sport and between sport, okay? Let me repeat that. So if we're looking inter or intra-sport differences, we have to take that in consideration. Okay? So if all of a sudden I get a research article or even a, a, a literature review type article that has addressed deceleration and it's tennis specific or it's football specific or it's volleyball specific, it's only specific to that sport. Okay? And our population, you guys, me, et cetera, we're lacking in this area. So we need to think about the inter and intra sport differences. Does the person need to reaccelerate, or are they doing it based on boundaries? Okay, those are the types of things I'm talking about. Even intra-sport, meaning within the sport. The way that I teach uh, Antoine Winfield, a, a corner that I work with, versus a, a John Carlson or a Kyle Rudolph, one of the tight ends for the Vikings, is gonna be much different in regards to deceleration, just like it would be with acceleration. Just like their demands are in regards to everything else that they do. That's how specific I need to get, and I feel like we as a whole don't necessarily get, need to get that specific right away if you're working with lower level of development of athletes, but it's things for us to think about as they move up that level or hierarchy of sport mastery, okay? Uh, we can look at bilateral versus unilateral change of direction or deceleration, because it's gonna be much, much different the type of position that we're gonna have to attain. We can look at the common directional changes because what did I say earlier, right from the onset in regards to deceleration, is that most of it comes down to setting yourself up for reacceleration. So if we don't know the common directional changes, we are already behind the eight ball. Okay? We have to think about these things because they're gonna impact the line of force that we attain, the joint angles, and the position of the limbs. All of that stuff is huge for movement efficiency. And all of it's stuff that I see in regards to my NFL guys when they first come to me. When we go through, when we go through uh, our GPP phases and and obviously for an NFL athlete, their bodies are beat up. You know, I have to take them through a long, slower, gradual GPP. And then I have a very, very set time. I, like I said earlier, I may have eight, 12 weeks, something of that nature. And they're already working concurrently with their strength coach. But there's things that I have to get very specific on. And usually, it's deceleration. Because even from year to year, I've known Antoine since 2006. This past off season, we focused in on deceleration. Six years ago, we focused in on deceleration, okay? The guy's a four-time pro bowler and has been in the league for 14 years, 35 years old. You would think his technical mastery is perfected, right? It's not because of where we started based on everything he had done prior to that point, okay? Uh, we have to look at if it's pre-programmed or closed versus unanticipated and opened directional changes or stops. Huge difference, okay? The research that's out there obviously in regards to change of direction is much different in regards to muscle characteristics or neuromuscular characteristics in, in, in uh, specific, as well as the types of positions that we attain if it's pre-programmed, meaning we know where the heck we're going, okay? Versus if it's unanticipated or opened. It's the reason why all day is gonna truck people all night tonight. 
Okay? Because he knows where he's going and other people do not. Okay? Huge difference. Okay? And obviously the surface used big time in regards to sports specific. If we have two volleyball players, one plays beach volleyball, one plays hardcore, it's a pretty intuitively obvious that they're going to probably have to stop in different ways, right? So we have to think about the surface that we're using. I realize that some of you have limited resources, meaning that you may not have access to a field year in and year out, or month in and month out throughout the year. However, we have to get as close as possible to replicating that, because it's different to stop on grass than it is the hardwood. Okay? Intuitively obvious, but we miss the boat. Everything changes with our movement technique, and if everything changes with our movement technique and we're doing it over and over and over again, are we developing good habits or are we developing bad habits? Obviously, again, I answered my own question. Okay? The other idea is this, individual specific, we have to get to the point where we're analyzing athletes, where we're investigating athletes, so we know what is happening, why it's happening, in order to determine how to perfect it. Okay? Individual specificity, level of mastery is huge here. Obviously, a guy like, I'll use another perfect example with Antoine, simply because he and I are close. Antoine has a younger son who's 14 years old, is a freshman in high school, plays football, is going to be a stud one day in the NFL. I am predicting it right now, and mostly just because I want to be in his entourage as he, as he gets old. Okay? But his level of mastery and Antoine Sr.'s level of mastery are considerably different. So I have to take that in consideration if I were to be training both of them, we can't expect them to look the same. Also, anthropometrically, okay? Now, Antoine's a little guy, but Antoine Jr. is even littler, okay? Same type of idea here. Their features are going to change the way that they move. So is muscle dominance and some of the things that we've done from a training standpoint prior to that point, okay? And obviously, other things such as strength level, neuromuscular control, Ground contact efficiency is huge. So if they've done a lot of things in the past that have addressed ground contact efficiency from throughout the whole kinematic chain all the way up from the ground, that's going to impact the way that I teach them how to decelerate. These are things that I need to, you guys to think about. And it's the reason why when I'm about to show you some of the common stopping tactics that we utilize and that we work into training, that these are things that you need to think about. The, the things that we're talking about in regards to movement technique are not a constant, okay? So when you see the pictures of me doing it, don't expect that you may necessarily look the same, okay? I'm a short little guy that kind of waddles everywhere, okay? That's much different in comparison to a guy who's 6'1", 6'2", 6'3", and has a different position of his center of mass, okay? This, I forgot the slide was in here, but we'll, we'll work with it, okay? The penultimate step is huge. Okay, so I'm glad it is. Those of you who've trained jumpers or jumping athletes know how important this is to maintain speed before your plant. Those of you who don't know what the penultimate step is, it's essentially the next to the last step before your plant step. It must have very, very close attention paid to it in regards to the movement execution that you're seeing utilized. This is one of the reasons why coaches fire me up when I see them just go through drills, especially in directional changes, and they're not actually coaching the mechanics of the movement. If you're just doing drills for the sake of drills, you're probably not focusing on the aspects that we're talking about right now. So this is so important because it essentially determines the position of the center of mass prior to your plant, which is, if you really start to think about it, is vitally important. It must be as short as the athlete can handle, the ground contact time. So it's going to be a shorter step right prior to planting, and it needs to be a fast, rapid step. So your foot needs to cycle off the ground quickly. We got, that means we got to put a lot of force in the ground in a very short period of time in order to start stopping ourselves early. It also is very important to make sure that we're able to maintain the speed. And obviously, if we're bringing speed and we got to have control, we have to have tremendous force absorption, eccentric strength in order to be efficient at what we do. Okay? These next ones, oh, look at that good-looking cat right there. Um, that's me, by the way. That was sarcasm. Okay? Um, I'm not that egotistical, contrary to popular belief. Um, here's some stopping techniques that we utilize, okay? All specific to what the sport demands may be, but these are the four basic ones that we utilize. Pretty good authors on the subjects have mentioned anywhere from two to four to stopping techniques we utilize for in our programming, okay? We start with a parallel stop, and I can send you guys videos of this if you hit me up and email me after this, okay, after this presentation. Um, I will make the side note that I left my entire stack of cards on 
the, in the airport uh, on, on the chair next to me. So I have like literally two and a half cards, okay? But just look me up, you'll be able to find my name, okay? Uh, obviously in the booklet. This stopping technique is obviously our most basic one, okay? But this is what has occurred after we've already gone through our deceleration phase and we've come to a complete stop. But what we're looking at here is a position for reacceleration. Obviously, it just looks like an athletic ready position, right? Well, it should, okay? <laughs> because that's essentially what you're looking to come to as optimally as humanly possible. If you watch all day stutter step on somebody tonight and he sets this up before he spins right, okay, and leaves Charles Woodson looking for, for him, but he's not gonna find him, that he's gonna spin right out of this, okay? But this is the exact same position that he came to a complete stop with after his deceleration. We go from there into a lunge stop, which could take us into maybe a crossover step or something of that nature. Or if, I have to, if I'm a tennis player and I have to execute a, an explosive movement, obviously if this picture was from the side, okay, I did the deer in the headlight looks up there on a purpose. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> it was just taken of me doing it live, obviously. Okay? But I want you to look at the coiled position. When we go back to what Antoine and I did, okay, Everything, our whole mantra for, we, all, with all of my athletes, I develop a mantra for the off season. And everything for Antoine was coil and uncoil. That was it. So when Antoine's in his back pedal, I want him thinking coil, uncoil, coil, uncoil. That's it. Okay? And obviously this position is one that after he has to stop in his back pedal and stab and move in any different plane or direction is one that's going to be advantageous for him to reorient his body towards reacceleration. It's a coiled position. Okay, this could also be utilized. I implore you to use this as well. Even if your athlete doesn't necessarily need to come to a complete stop in this, obviously requiring them to do so, what step will it affect? Even if they don't ever stop like this in the sport? The penultimate step, okay? Because that is essentially what the penultimate step looks like. Okay, because a lot of things can happen after this. From here we can look at an angled stop. Okay, obviously very important again for maybe a corner or something of that nature, a linebacker who's gonna have to move back and bail in coverage. Okay, a lot of other sport application, of course. Again, coil and uncoil. Obviously, if you look at my movement position, okay, or my stop position there, my hips are extraordinarily flexed down in, and I have a low center of mass, so obviously I can get a little lower than most people, but I also have a detached glute that was never fully reattached on this side, so I can't even fully get down, okay? I would actually implore myself to be maybe a little wider from my stance phase and drop in. This was also taken a number of weeks ago, and those of you who remember me from last year uh, may realize that last year I had a full knee immobilizer because I tore my patella tendon last New Year's Eve on a little jump stunt, okay? So I still haven't been fully cleared to do a lot of change of direction multiplanar yet. Okay, because I haven't cleared myself because I really don't trust myself. Okay, so this position likely should be a little wider stance and a little deeper of flexion. Okay, to reorient myself because the direction that I need to go from here is anywhere. Okay, it's very diverse. Um, from here we can obviously look a lateral stop as well. I don't believe that those, even those individuals who are teaching stopping are teaching people how to, how to lateral stop. Okay, huge guys, huge. Okay, notice the position for reacceleration. Again, I should likely be a little wider, especially because I'm short and stout, okay? Kind of like a little teapot. And we gotta have a wider stance, be able to reorient our body, okay? Here's the common mistakes though, and this is a, a big take home slide for y'all, okay? Oh, I threw y'all in there, I just caught myself. Um, not setting yourself up for reacceleration. And obviously the host of, the, host of factors and mistakes underneath all really come back to this is not setting yourself for reacceleration or not setting yourself up properly to execute your commonly executed sport tasks. Okay? The next one, too long a time in either the last two steps, either your plant step or in your penultimate step. I like him to think of this like a jumper. Okay? A lot of it because of my background is a jumping. Okay? So that's the way I think about this idea and this concept. Therefore, we cannot have too much dampening after contact, because if we have a lot of dampening after our foot is contacted to the ground, either in our penultimate step or in our plant step, if we go back to why I had that little scientific tidbits at the beginning where you guys were still kind of sleepy, okay, you guys are like the honey badger, still a little sleepy, okay, we likely will have no reacceleration based on the stress shortening cycle, and we make that too concentrically dominated. 
This also will happen if our foot gets too far out in front of our center of mass before a fish in change of direction or even if we just have to come to a complete stop. Some of the research that's been done in the industry has uh, talked about just being able to stop efficiently and bring our, our body to a stop. Now, physics would tell us that we obviously would want our foot out in front of us very far anteriorly, okay? So we lay back and our center of mass gets, starts slowing down and we have a longer distance and time to do it. But guys, sport isn't about time and distance. So our foot can't get too far out in front of us, okay? Also, this happens when we get too great a knee extension at the initial foot contact. We know a host of other things that can happen when we get our foot contact um, when it's too great a knee extension, right? Some little things called ACL, MCL, high ankle sprains, hamstrings, et cetera, low back issues, okay? We also see a lot of lack of trunk control. I see this a lot in my NFL guys because of a, a, some synergistic dominance at times, okay, because of pre-motor patterns that have been set over a long period of time. So we have to re um, teach our body at that point the neuromuscular efficiency needed to control our body from a kinematic chain level, okay? Not just so much one joint orientation, okay? We also see a lot of people have too narrow a base of support, like you saw before. In, in my own personal pictures, it's something that I need to work on, okay? And then trying to be too light on your feet. Guys, stopping is violent. Okay? Stopping is violent just like landing is. I've said this for years. And the idea is if I have to re-accelerate and I'm at a high, as I move up higher levels of mastery, I need to stop more rapidly. It needs to be violent. There's none of this pixie prancing around. Okay? So any of the stutter steps are coming simply based, either maybe based on if you have to set somebody up for re-acceleration or for cutting actions. But a lot of times people are trying to be way too nimble. It should be violent. Okay? Every step as you come in there, you are trying to tear the ground up, okay? And you are trying to push a hole through the ground with your foot as you come to a stop because you have very limited time in order to do that, okay? Here's my progression. We go from slow to fast acceleration velocity. Usually that goes from a short to long acceleration distance before going to those stopping positions. We'll take that and have them also do a preconceived uh, exertion in regards to 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, because we know what happens when someone goes 100% if they've only done 50%, okay? This is my whole wax on, wax off theory, okay, that you're probably going to see in a slide coming up. But so we go from long to short uh, deceleration distance in, so I always put a spot where I need them to stop within a certain distance. Here's where you've been stopping. We continue to close that gap so they can do it in less time, in less distance. We also go from a more stable to a less stable base of support. So we'll go from the parallel lunge stop. And once they've mastered that, okay, everybody get that caveat? Once they have mastered that, we don't just jump in because Sean said we got these four stopping styles. Once they have mastered that, we move on to an angle, then we move on to a lunge, so on and so forth. We'll also take it in multiplanar from linear to lateral to backward, okay? And then we also go from a higher to a lower joint angle, okay? at every joint that's involved, hips, knees, toes, et cetera, that's gonna be specific. And then we'll go from pre-programmed or closed to unanticipated or open. Guys, here's the thing. A lot of you guys have deceleration movement characteristics built into your drills, but we are not taking the time to focus in on what is actually occurring when we try to execute said drill. I implore you to take a little bit more time, take a step back, and try to actually teach from a pedagogical standpoint and a motor learning standpoint how your athletes should be executing so they develop the higher level of mastery. Because then the other things that you guys are doing fantastic with, the concentrically dominated things, we can incorporate training methods that are going to actually help enhance the movement execution either in deceleration or any other host of sport motor task. Okay, perfect technique and execution is key. I would say that even with deceleration, it's more key. Take the time to focus in on it, you won't regret it. So this is my wax on, wax off, paint the fence type theory, okay? Do it over and over and over and over again. It's about mastery, guys, okay? Now, I have a host of drills, means, and methods that you're about to see. I'm gonna go through each one quickly. However, I wanted to put it in the booklet so you have essentially my progressions and how I try to increase motor potential. So I have about five minutes. I will literally go through these uh, at rapid micro machine auction uh, type pace, okay? Barefoot drills, I think are huge. We use it to develop proprioception and body positioning as well as lower leg foot and strengthening, okay? 
Uh, could be very creative with this. Once I start, my NFL guys swear by this. Okay, even in their potentiation workouts yesterday or the day before, they were doing barefoot drills. They love it from a body positioning standpoint. Okay, and it makes the feet from the ground on up the kinetic chain very, very strong. Okay, we'll go from that into a stick movement, which is just base eccentric strength, base deceleration mechanics, where I'm just falling into that lunge. I do that, try to continue to force the idea and cue the idea of stopping on a dime. Okay. We'll do that in a lateral fashion as well. Obviously, you have the pictures, hence the reason why I implored you to, do, uh, to uh, download this. If you don't have the ability to download it, email me. Okay? And if you ever want to talk about these things, I'd be happy to do so. Um, we look at landings. We really try to focus in on two-leg bilateral landings, stopping, sticking the position. This stuff is all from Jimmy Radcliffe, uh, who just won a Fiesta Bowl the other night, so kudos to him. Um, stop on a dime, teaching the body so we can minimize ground contact time efficiently. We can take that then into traditional plyos of multiple sorts, which you guys are doing fantastic with already from, an e or from a concentric rate of force development standpoint. Okay? But we now look at it for eccentric loading. We look at it for its original purpose and what Verkoshansky originally wanted plyos utilized for. Okay? Focus on eccentric ability, establishing landing mechanics. We modify everything to be in regards to deceleration. From there, this is key. Okay, and I, I won't be able to do this justice. Isometrics should have an entire presentation done for it. Isometrics for sport movement. So if anybody's filling out those, uh, you know, those sheets, those evaluation sheets after this, request isometrics. At least isometrics for sport application, not isometrics the way you traditionally think about it. Because it's a different intra and intermuscular coordination that's required for a, a contraction of an isometric sort, especially when it happens after a dynamic ballistic one. Okay, and then if a dynamic contraction has to occur afterwards. Okay, we do a lot of true isos. That movement right there is maybe my favorite movement that I do for my NFL athletes as we teach either the stopping position, because obviously I can change the flexion based on where, those rack is, where that rack is set up. I know it might be hard to see. Okay, I have a video of, doing, of me doing this. If you want it, email me, I get it to you. Okay, um, it's just a hold go, guys. Okay, I'm not really doing anything except for looking good. Okay. So co-contraction at the greatest flexion angles. From there, we move into dynamic isometrics. Okay? This will just be any movement that you guys already utilize, any movement that you guys already utilize, just focusing in on stopping points. It can be with a quick eccentric down to the point, stop, hold, one, two, explode up. Or it could be multiple stopping points. Always make the eccentric happen quickly. Okay? As fast and as humanly possible, and always make the concentric as rapid as possible as well. But I like this for teaching position and kinematic characteristics. I got like a minute before they, they swing me off. But then we also do some oscillatory quasi-isometrics. If you haven't seen this, it's essentially like a light switch going up and down in whatever position, very, very quickly and rapidly. It's going to be like a, you could either do it from a time standpoint. I use the coaching cue like a light switch where we're just flipping it, okay? and it's to get movement to happen from a relaxation to a contraction cycle very quickly. It's exactly what has to happen when our foot strikes the ground in our penultimate step or our plant step. And then we look at traditional shock movements, which most of you guys have heard me talk about before. If you haven't, I have other presentations I could send you as well that focus solely on our prescription and our planning and our programming with altitude drops as well as depth jumps, which we obviously, as you can tell from both those slides, we do it in multiplanar. It's not just going vertical. In most cases, we're actually going horizontal, which is the bottom picture or we might go lateral in our depth jumps, okay? And then we look at overspeed eccentrics in a number of different fashions with bands here, with a kettlebell there, where we can really focus in on, on the way that we can move a rapidly moving load, okay? Then ex accentuated eccentrics, give me 30 seconds. Accentuated eccentrics where we develop the eccentric control. This is where we just focus in on lowering slowly. I'm not a huge fan but we need to use it, especially in those athletes who display a lack of posture balance, stability, flexibility, or maximal strength, okay? Um, and then we look at deceleration drills with a load, maybe a little too overdone, okay? We use it a lot, mostly once my athletes have developed the technical mastery in order to execute movement most efficiently, okay? But never ever sacrifice technique for greater load or speed, because that makes it much more difficult. And then downhill running, weighted vest. guys. Sorry for going through everything, everything is so rapid, okay? Like I said, I will sit outside until 7 p.m. if need be. I am more than happy to talk to anybody about this topic or about any other topic. Please feel free to hit me up, but you can see the importance that I place on deceleration. If I wouldn't have taken this change, I wouldn't have my athletes doing what they do on the field tonight 
or tomorrow or whenever it is that they step on the field next. Okay? It's vitally important. Thank you. God bless. And uh, if you need anything from me, that's where to find me.